I can tell you the first time I came here to apply for a job, uh, I felt like in a James Bond movie. I saw this whole apparatus and was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> I think humans always adapt to stuff. So when you come here every day, at some point you don't perceive it as being so amazing anymore. But of course, then people come and tell you and then you're reminded. And yeah, this is a really great working environment. The question is always, how do you trick people into believing that they're actually in the car or in a plane? So of course, we cannot replicate the high accelerations you feel in a car for a long time. Maybe we could go along this track for eight meters, but then the track runs out, so we cannot simulate more forward acceleration. And then we have to start doing tricks. And therefore, you combine the physical motion with an intelligent visual stimulus, and your brain has to interpret all these signals and then come to a coherent percept. And that's what we are investigating here, how to create a coherent percept that tricks you into believing that you actually are in a car or in a plane. So we have several safety mechanisms here. So we have written custom software here at the Institute. So we have a whole robotics group uh, that has been working for some years on that and uh, road control algorithms. And so what we can do is we either give some motions which are predetermined, so we know beforehand what the robot will do, or we have uh, so-called closed loop trajectories where we actually put the control devices like a joystick or a steering wheel inside. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have a tracking system. Is this a bit like something like a Kinect or something? No, it's because the Kinect is a depth camera, right? And this is a optical tracker. So oh. I can show you on the... So you have markers like these, these infrared markers. And this is now the Oculus Rift head-mounted display. And then these markers are tracked by the tracking system down here. And then once you move your head, it will track where you actually are in space and how you are oriented and then it updates the image, the visual image that you're going to see. Uh, does yeah. that have any impact on the movement of the robot? In our case, no. So in our case, the robot motion is pre-programmed and this is just for you looking around in the virtual environment. Yeah. Okay. But it would be possible to link those if you were doing a different... Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. At one point we had a Formula One simulator where you were driving along Monza because all our roboticists were from Italy, so they implemented a Ferrari on Monza. <laughs> um, so it's very nice because then the robot actually yeah, reacts to what you are doing and tries to mimic as best as possible the motions uh, so that you feel like you're in a real race car, for example. Yeah. So is that noise it moving now? Yeah, exactly. So now they are calibrating it with these high frequency motions that we did. Uh, we ran into some, uh, yeah, issues that we didn't have before because usually we've done more low frequency stuff and so now they are figuring out how to optimize the simulator for these high frequencies. Yeah. And what are those high frequencies are supposed to be replicated? Well, for this experiment we want to replicate turbulence like you experience it in an airplane and that usually is a high frequency motion. I mean you all know it once you experience it it starts shaking around and we do this for like 10 seconds here to make you feel as if you're on an airplane experiencing such turbulences. The idea is to get uh, virtual reality headsets into airplanes so that while you're on an airplane you can wear if you want to, if you choose to do so, wear a head mount display and actually try to forget about that you are in an airplane and rather feel like you're at the beach or in the mountains or in some scenario where it's open space where you can actually relax, where you can maybe also forget about the passengers next to you and just get out of the maybe stressful environment of the airplane. So this is uh, the airplane environment, one for each eye for your left and your right, and then you get a stereo view, so they are slightly offset, so you can perceive that the whole thing is in 3D. So on the right screen here, that's the infrared camera that's looking inside of the cabin. So right now there's no one sitting in here. Then up here, that's the control screen for the robot. So what you can see here, all these numbers are commands that are sent to the robot and that they are controlling the motion of the robot. It takes uh, about 40 milliseconds from when we send it until the robot actually does the motion. That's where we program the motions of the robot. So once the motion is programmed, it's going to be sent to this computer, because this is the computer in the end that is controlling. These are some more control screens uh, that are more low level, that implement all the safety stuff, if they run into limits, and yeah, if you actually want to control the robot to come back to the starting position or drive to the starting position. Perfect. So that's the race car seat yeah. that you're having there. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been to a race car before. You see that you are in an airplane. And at some point, you do transition to a beach scenario. Yeah, if you don't like it, maybe it's also an enclosed space. Some people are yeah. from an enclosed space. Then at some point, we want to test uh, what happens if turbulence comes in an airplane. So what we do during the real experiment, we also take physiological measures. So we measure your heart rate yeah. and skin conductance. What does that do to you? Will you still believe that you are at the beach? Or will you forget about the beach, think about the airplane again? If you move, if you shake your head around, yeah, you're likely to get sick. So just move it slowly, but then you should. Yeah. These head-mounted displays are becoming rather cheap now and affordable. So the one that you have been wearing before is the prototype that they are selling for 300 US dollars at the moment. Okay, then we give you an image again and then it starts. 
So just be free to look around and uh, enjoy your flight. <laughs> So then you get the virtual environment at the beach, you can look around, you can see your body, you can see the waves at the ocean, you can see some palm trees. And uh, then at some point we want to test uh, what happens if turbulence comes on the airplane. Imagine you're sitting in an airplane, you're wearing this head-mounted display, you think you're at the beach, but at some point the airplane starts shaking. Uh, ah, now, now it's starting to shake a bit. Might it actually be relaxing for you that you can think, okay, I am now at the beach, there's also my magic carpet shaking a bit, and there's maybe just some strong wind, but it's all good and I'm more relaxed and I forget about the turbulence. So that's the type of research question that we're looking at. Uh, that also has stereo projection capabilities. So you have two projectors. So if you don't want to use the head-mounted display as you just did, you can have two projectors behind you which are projecting on this curved screen in front. So you can just use the whole cabin as a projection screen and get, a, I think, 160 degree view also. So it's very immersive. So then you can wear uh, stereo glasses as you get in the cinema and get also nice 3D images. Already almost everyone has a smartphone, so maybe in the future everyone could just take his own smartphone and then you put it into a certain plastic frame with two lenses and then you can look at your smartphone, use your smartphone as the display and also as the sensors for tracking your head motions. You download an app that will transport you to the beach, so basically you have your own virtual reality headset always in your pocket already. So these are motions that we run every morning to test if everything is working uh, correctly. This simulator costs around a quarter million, which is comparably cheap to uh, other simulators of that size of these motion capabilities. So we're having it since several years at the Institute and it's been used for lots of projects. Usually you have uh, small platforms with hydraulic legs and these cost maybe in the order of uh, 50,000, but they are much more restricted in their motion range. And then usually you go to very big simulators, which cost millions. And uh, we have, yeah, with a quarter million, we are in the middle range, which I think still gives us a really nice motion range for it. Yeah. Does it ever go wrong? <laughs> like every technical device, of course, uh, we sometimes run into problems. <laughs> that is uh, more often caused also by uh, our faults, right? So we are humans, we make faults in programming it, but of course there's a lot of safety stuff behind it. So nothing can seriously go wrong. The only thing that happens is usually that it doesn't move in the way we want and then it stops, right? But it never moves in a crazy way that we did not foresee, right? So the only thing that goes wrong is that it stops and doesn't move. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they use these robots, of course, they use them for serious applications in industry. Mostly, I think, for car manufacturing, so taking parts and welding stuff and Porsche or Daimler. Yeah, yeah, they have these robots. We have the only pink one, yeah. <laughs> you can walk around the chair, you can look underneath. You don't need to teach anyone how to use the system in that way. They put these glasses on, and they walk around. All the chocolate bars are available, but not as nice.